Hey friends, this is Brett Landis, and it's my privilege to bring you a quick biography of John Patton, who was a missionary to the South Pacific during the 1800s. Let me open by reading Hebrews 13.7, which gives us an idea of why we should do Christian biography. Hebrews 13.7 says, Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Well, I think uh, along those lines, John Patton is... Uh, one of these people we should imitate, consider what he did and what God enabled him to do and how God used him, uh, and we should imitate his conduct. So a quick biographical sketch. Uh, John Patton was born May 1824 in Scotland, and he grew up in a godly family. As a young man, he felt called to missions, uh, and so along those lines, he ultimately moved to Glasgow to pursue training in theology, and he picked up some medical training that also be helpful for him later. He uh, became a city missionary, and he worked for a number of years in Glasgow and had great success. God really blessed his ministry there, and in fact, he was able to accomplish some things among the poor of the city that had not been done for a long time. Uh, so it was a, a very fruitful ministry, but he still felt called to the foreign mission field. And so when he got an opportunity to uh, be sent out, uh, he applied and was uh, ordained, and so he left for the New Hebrides, which was these islands in the South Pacific in March of 1858. Uh, he'd just been married, uh, and he arrived in an island called Tana in November 1858. And he spent about the next four years on that island, and it was an incredibly trying time. In fact, shortly after he arrived there, after he and his wife were settled on the island, uh, they had their first child, and after only a few months, both his wife and the child died. And Patton was marked by incredible diligence in doing the Lord's work and administering faithfully to these people. He spent uh, those four years with only a few conversions, but he labored faithfully teaching and preaching and was constantly in danger. Uh, one of the things you should know about the New Hebrides is that they were literally inhabited by cannibals. And a number of missionaries who worked there were actually uh, literally eaten by cannibals. And so during his time there, he was constantly in danger he was sick a lot of the time, and there was not a lot of support. He was basically by himself with a few missionaries in the surrounding islands. And at the end of those four years, he was in such danger that he had to flee. So he spent, uh, he, he was able to get out. He spent about the next five years returning to Scotland and going around uh, other, uh, uh, other countries like Australia, and he raised missionary support. Uh, his heart was still to serve in the, the New Hebrides, and so he spent those years just raising funding and raising up other missionaries to come back with him. He actually got remarried, and uh, they headed back. And so they were back in the New Hebrides in August 1866. And instead of going back to the island of Tana, he went to an island called Aniwa. And then he spent basically the rest of his life preaching and teaching and ministering to the people of Aniwa. And then he would also travel, and he raised support for missionaries, and he basically just invested himself in the New Hebrides Islands. And so by 1899, the New Testament was printed in the language of Aniwa, and there were missionaries in 25 of the 30 islands of the New Hebrides. So God really blessed these, these later years. Uh, he died January 1907 in Australia, aged 82. And I think there's at least three things that we can learn and uh, see exemplified in the life of Patton that really help us. Uh, and so I'll, I'll read you some quotes from his autobiography, which is where we get most of our information about him uh, to help us uh, reinforce these points. So the first thing that we see about Patton is that he was a man who was marked by communion with God. And this is something that he learned from an early age from his father. He was really influenced by his father, who was a man that he felt like really walked with God. And the nearness of God and the comfort of God was uh, just a huge blessing to him and really sustained him as he went through these island trials. So I think uh, as we think about communion with God, it wasn't some sort of mysticism, but rather we see that he uh, had fellowship with God through the truth of God's word and through the promises. He really felt the nearness of God in, in the context of all these things that he suffered. So uh, let me read you a short passage from his book. This is right after the, the loss of his wife. He says, Stunned by that dreadful loss in entering upon this field of labor to which the Lord had himself so evidently led me, my reason seemed for a time almost to give way. Ague and fever, too, laid a depressing and weakening hand upon me, continuously recurring, and reaching oftentimes the very height of its worst burning stages, 
but I was never altogether forsaken. The ever-merciful Lord sustained me to lay the precious dust of my beloved ones in the same quiet grave. Then he says, I labored on for the salvation of these savage islanders amidst difficulties, dangers, and deaths. Whensoever Tana turns to the Lord and is one for Christ, men in after days will find the memory of that spot still green, where with ceaseless prayers and tears I claimed that land for God in which I had buried my dead with faith and hope. But for Jesus and the fellowship he vouchsafed me there, I must have gone mad and died beside that lonely grave. And so we see he really felt the closeness of God, and he really, um, in walking with God, he, he felt the nearness of God and understood that God really was with him and really was his Father and really was blessing him. I think that sustained him. And I think we do well to imitate that and to, to invest ourselves in knowing God better and in walking with him day by day. The second thing I think we could learn from the life of Patton is that he was a man who was consecrated to God. And really, it's one of the themes you see throughout his whole life. Is he dedicated himself to the service of God and of God's kingdom. Uh, even from his days as a city missionary, he was a very diligent worker. And eventually, as he became a missionary, he gave up his yeah, in many ways, his health and his possessions and really his whole life was just dedicated and set aside to the service of God. Uh, and I think one of the best things about his autobiography is that you see as he's consecrated, as he keeps investing himself again and again and again in the kingdom of God, it's not some sort of cruel service. It's something that really leads to joy. And so here's a, a quote that I think exemplifies that. He says, uh, describing the missionary life, in many respects, it is a simple and happy and beautiful life. The man whose heart is full of things that are dear to Jesus feels no desire to exchange it for the poor frivolities of what calls itself society, which seem to be, which seem to find its life in pleasures that Christ cannot be asked to share, and in which, therefore, Christians should have neither lot nor part. So he says by dedicating himself to God, he didn't feel like he was missing out on anything. In fact, he feels like he got the, the best possible life and had the best possible outcome for his life. So I think, again, that sets a good example for us. We should ask ourselves, how dedicated am I to the service of God? How much of my life is invested in the service of God's kingdom? And uh, do I believe that God will give me great joy in serving him? Uh, Patton certainly did. Uh, the third and final thing is I think we see throughout his life, he really trusted in God, and especially in the midst of the incredible trials that he went through. Uh, I'll read you two quotes. Um, again, one of the constant dangers that he faced was being killed by these uh, these islanders. So, he says uh, in this story, Next day, a wild chief followed me about for four hours with his loaded musket, and though often directed towards me, God restrained his hand. I spoke kindly to him and attended to my work as if he had not been there, fully persuaded that my God had placed me there and would protect me until my allotted task was finished. Looking up in unceasing prayer to our dear Lord Jesus, I left all in his hands and felt immortal till my work was done. Trials and hairbreadth escapes strengthened my faith and seemed only to nerve me for more to follow, and they did tread swiftly upon each other's heels. Without that abiding consciousness of the presence and power of my dear Lord and Savior, nothing else in all the world would have preserved me from losing my reason and perishing miserably. So again, we just see that he, he really trusted God. He knew even with someone pointing a loaded gun at him, that that person could not pull the trigger, could not harm him unless God allowed it, unless God permitted it. Um, the second one, I think, a uh, second example of this, he, we see how he really trusted God in the midst of his trials uh, and felt the, the power and presence of God to be blessing him and sustaining him and the wisdom of God to be uh, even ordaining these trials for his good and for God's glory. So he says, It was difficult to be resigned, left alone, and in sorrowful circumstance, but feeling immovably assured that my God and Father was too wise and loving to err in anything that he does or permits, I looked up to the Lord for help, and struggled on in his work. I do not pretend to see through the mystery of such visitations, wherein God calls away the young, the promising, and the sorely needed for his service here. But this I do know and feel, that in the light of such dispensation, it becomes us all to love and serve our blessed Lord Jesus, so that we may be ready at his call for death and eternity. And I think Patton was certainly a man who did that. He, he really lived out those principles of, of trusting God. So I encourage you to think about, how do you trust God? Do you believe that God can sustain you? Do you believe that God has care for you in the midst of your trials? Do you see that he's a, a wise and loving father who's willing to, to deal with you in love and in grace? If you don't, I, I'd encourage you to, one, obviously read scripture, but two, also think about the lives of people like 
Patton. And so if you want some resources to learn more about him, you can read his autobiography. Uh, it's a great book. It's a, a thrilling read as you read about what God did in sustaining him. He had uh, numerous escapes from, from near death, and God brought him through all those trials and and blessed his ministry and really gave him joy in seeing his uh, his work become fruitful for God's kingdom. Uh, you can also listen to John Piper's biography. You can find it on DesiringGod.org. I think you'll find it really encouraging, and I think it'll be a, a blessing for you. So uh, with that, we'll close, and uh, I hope this has been a, a fruitful time for you, and I hope you have uh, gained some insight on how this man served God and what God did in sustaining and blessing him. So uh, thanks for your time.